Hi, Carrie Kidnaps Human here, and some of you might already know this, but I'm a speed cuber. That means I solve Rubik's Cubes as fast as possible, and I go to competitions to race against other people, but I never win. If you look in a few of my videos, you can find my speed cubes lying on my desk, so now you know why. I know my audience is mostly middle and high school kids, and speed cubing is pretty popular among the youngins too. So I just wanted to take this time to point out that I've been speed cubing for longer than a lot of you have been alive. Because here's a picture of me in China in 2001 with a cube. And I was four, and I don't really think this counts because I couldn't even solve one face. I distinctly remember getting 7 out of 9 of the orange ones and being happy with that. Also, I didn't touch a cube for 12 years after that, and I got back into the hobby in 2013 when I was 16. But yeah, I'm so old. Before moving on, I gotta prove my street cred. So um, here's me solving a 3x3x3 on camera. That says 10.79, aren't you amazed and bewildered and- Isn't the world record less than a third of that? You know, right now I really don't need you to- So yeah, to solve this thing, I average 12 seconds and my best is 7.68. If you want to get started speed cubing, I highly recommend that you learn the Roo method instead of the CFOP method because you can achieve similarly fast times with both, but let's be honest, Roo just looks, reads, and tastes cooler. Use Roo, join the Roovolution, and be part of something actually special. JK, use whatever you want. Also, feel like I'm your biggest fan. And also, to clear up a misconception, you don't need to be smart to learn how to cube. Just follow an online tutorial, I'll link a few good ones below. If you learned how to type, you can learn how to cube. And trust me, there's a lot of dumb cubers. Oh, did I tell you that I also practice solving Rubik's Cubes blindfolded? The way it works is, you start the timer, and then you inspect and memorize the scrambled cube without making any turns. Then you put on the blindfold, solve it from memory, and stop the timer. So to improve, it's important to both memorize and execute as fast as possible. Uh, hmm... Just watch me do the solve, okay? By the way, this might be the first time you've ever seen both the animated me and the real me at the same time. Pretty mind-blowing, huh? Which ones do you like better? It's gotta be the animated me, right? I mean, I've got perfectly smooth skin and a scrumptiously plump mouth Shh, and- I'm trying to focus. Jeez, way to overreact. <laughs> Sensitive much? It's hard to memorize when you're talking so loud. Okay, fine. I'll shut up for a few minutes and let you do your thing. Oh, it's not gonna take that long. You know, everyone's looking for someone to be with, but me, you don't have to worry, cause I got sub one. Extremely cringy jokes aside, yeah, I enjoy speed cubing, as nerdy as it seems, but showing off my solves isn't what this video's about. If you want to see that, check out my speed cubing channel, Cube Roll, where I upload solves with commentary, solves with AI music, animated bar graphs, and other visualizations. Today, I want to talk to you about Loopover, which was my attempt at a two-dimensional Rubik's Cube. Why did I name it Loopover? Well, let me show you. I named it Loopover because- okay, stop that. I named it Loopover because the rows loop over when you drag them.
So as you can see, Loop Over consists of a 5x5 five five board, and there's 25 tiles, each of which has a letter on it. And if you click on one letter and drag it horizontally, it's going to shift that row horizontally, as you can see. And then if I drag it vertically, it also shifts that way. And you can do this for any letter you want, and if you do it enough, it's going to start scrambling the puzzle. Um, but the goal is to get it back into this position where they're in alphabetical order. So if I click scramble, it's going to do maybe a thousand random moves on the puzzle, which gives me a random state. And the goal is to get it all sorted again, like I said. So as I'm solving it now, uh, the timer is going because, of course, I want to do everything as fast as possible. So let's get going. My strategy here tends to be to first build a 3x3 square and then expand from there. So I start with A, B, and C. And then you have to remember that D and E go next to that, so F actually goes right below A. But you can't just drag F over here and then push it up, because that's going to push A out of the way, as you can see. So we have to use these two free columns on the right to bring F up, and then you can slide it over this way. Oh, but if you're real fancy, you can drag it to the right. That saves one move, because we moved two to the right instead of three to the left. One thing I should point out is that a lot of people are like, isn't this just a 15 puzzle? Or in other words, isn't this just a slider puzzle? So you know those puzzles where you have one empty spot in a grid and all the other tiles can slide into that empty spot and you solve it? That's a pretty common puzzle that a lot of people are familiar with, but it's not the same as this because like first you should realize that there are no empty spaces in loop over. And also in a slider puzzle, you're only moving one square at a time. But here, you're moving five. Like, there's no way to move fewer than five squares at once. So it's a different puzzle. Also, I'm done! See, it's all alphabetical. So I can do it in two minutes. That's pretty cool. So it is a different puzzle from the sliders. But, if you're... Okay, I'm gonna do it again, and I'm gonna do it a bit faster. Actually, new scramble, because I messed up. Now, if you've been in the loop in the puzzle community lately, you'll know that this is actually very similar to a different puzzle, called Switch Tile. It was made by Arifdex in 2014, so that's before Loop Over. And I think they released it to the Google Play Store, so kudos to you, Arif, for getting it out there. So, if you compare Loop Over and Switch Tile, the mechanics are pretty much the same as this, where you drag around tiles uh, and they loop over. The only real difference, well okay, I guess there's a few, okay so that was 27 seconds. For switch tile, not every tile is distinct. So you can see that with my puzzle, like every tile has to be in the correct spot. You can't possibly swap say B and C and expect it to still be solved. Whereas in switch tile, there's a bunch of tiles that are identical and you can swap them around and still be in a solved state. So that's one minor difference, though I could still see people accusing me of copying them. And to that, I say this. Even though I didn't really release this to the public until 2018, during US Nationals, I actually started working on this in 2013. And that was only three weeks after I started speed cubing. So I must have been really gung-ho. I was like, wow, I want to learn how to solve this cube. Oh, I can't be a world record holder because it's too hard. I'm going to start making my own puzzles. So like, here's a screenshot of that. And you can actually see I was working on a school project at the same time. And I think my friends were kind of fed up with me not focusing on a school project. So, yeah, there's that. I guess I just got super busy with stuff and I kind of let this sit on the sidelines and I didn't release it. But there you go, that's proof that I started working on Loop Over before Switch Tile was released. Okay, instead of just talking about random things as I'm solving the puzzle, maybe I should lead you through what I'm doing so that you can learn something. And you can go to this link online and play it for yourself whenever you want, so maybe you can figure out how to solve it too by watching this. So, I, like I said earlier, I start with a 3x3, three three, and I think that's pretty intuitive, and if you can't do that, just play around with stuff. M is one underneath where it should be, so then it's like that. So that's a 3x3, three three, pretty straightforward. Then I do the 1x3 column to the right of that, and those letters are D, I, N. And it's pretty much the same idea. So D, I need to bring it down here so that I can be brought in right underneath it. Oh, this is actually a really lucky case. I can just pull N over like that. And then when I bring it up, that whole 3x4 block is solved. Now, you might be tempted to solve the next 1x3 to the right of that, which would be E, J, and O. But I actually don't want to do that because I want to have one free row and one free column for as long as possible since those are the most helpful. So I'm going to solve this 4x1 
underneath the solved portion so far. And those letters are P, Q, R, S. So I'll bring P in, and then Q to the right of that, taking advantage of the free rows and columns, of course. R comes in, and I get lucky because S is in the right spot already. So boom, four by four solved. And now we're at last column, last row, which is where most people who solve this for the first time get stuck here. Uh, so I guess this is where you have to do a little more thinking or like experimenting. But the way I decide to solve this is pretty simple. So I'm gonna solve E, J, and O, and you'll see why I only do three in a bit. But now I only have one free row and free column, so if I wanna bring E and J closer together, there's no way I can do that without using this free row to put J to the side of it while I shift and fix E. So then I bring it back and we have E and G connected. And then O needs to be right below that, so I do that and then that. But at this point you might be like, uh-oh, because when you bring this up, you have this solved three by one, but there's only one free row left and you have to solve the U, V, W, X, Y, but there's no other tools to do that. Well, there actually is one more tool and that's this free spot here, which is why I didn't solve E, J, O, and T. I left that open because what I'm gonna do now is keyholing. Basically, whatever you have in that keyhole spot, which is the X, just push it down. Like, I don't care, just push it down wherever you want. Now you got pushed out of the way, so now it's in this spot. And somehow you have to bring that back up. Well, wherever you bring it up should be solved relative to the last piece you just put in. So X was inserted into that row, and U comes three before X, because it's U, V, W, X. So three before X would be here, where the Y is. So bring Y over to where that column is, and then bring U back up. Now that's kind of like a similar move, because now we pushed Y out of the way, and we need to insert Y back in, solved relative to the other two pieces so far. So Y comes before U. Now that's because it loops over, right? Y is the last letter in the row, then that actually comes before U as it loops over again. So we can just shift it over once and bring it down. And now there's actually only one letter left, because W ended up solved just by coincidence. When we solve V, well that's just one to the right of U, so we bring that up, and from here you can see the bottom row is completely solved in relation to each other. So you just gotta bring it back to the solve state like that and the whole thing is solved. So I think that should be enough of a tutorial for anyone to be able to solve it. But it gets really fun when you start practicing more and more and everything starts becoming second nature. So you don't, oh shoot. Okay, sorry, that was a glitch. Um, so you don't have to think so much about which letter comes next. Uh, the color coding also helps a lot. So I'm always looking at the uh, orange ones, kind of like F and K. Also, I'm using a mouse to drag around the pieces which you kind of have to do if you're on a computer. But if you play this on a phone, it's a lot easier because you can just drag with your finger on the touchscreen. But I'm running this game through open processing and I found that that platform is a little finicky on a lot of different devices. And I think that people on Android, like it doesn't work. Or maybe it doesn't work if you're not using Safari. All I know is that on my iPhone 10 with Safari, it does work. It should also work for any desktop and mouse. Um, when I was at US Nationals, I started like reinvesting myself in this game and I got this 16 second solve which you can see here and I thought I was like wow I'm so fast so I like posted it and I started sharing it with my friends. So 16 seconds pretty fast right? I was feeling like a king like no one could touch me but you know that saying where whenever you think you're good at anything there's always an Asian kid who's faster than you? Wait I'm Asian so that doesn't really work. Well when I shared this online with the speed cubing Facebook group these kids decided to hijack my dream. So check it out. Um, the board size I'm playing with is 5x5, five five, right? If you look at the history of the world record for the 5x5 five five loop over single, you can see that I had it for quite a while, right? I brought it down from 23, three years ago, down to, let's see, 12 there, 12 seconds. And then this kid, David, who does he think he is, breaks it with the first 11, and then he goes all the way down to sub 10, and I just feel like I'm inadequate now. Well, also he's a lot younger than me, so I think he has a lot more free time, his fingers are still more dexterous, mine are essentially withering away at this point. Feels bad, man, feels bad. So if you're losing world records left and right, you know what you're supposed to do, right? You invent new records. So here's me solving with my feet, and I still have the record for that. So yay me. I'm sure my parents are real proud. Oh, this isn't gonna make sense to people who aren't in the speed cubing community, but hashtag save feet. I am all for people who work really hard at an event to be taken seriously, even if it seems very silly to those who don't compete in the event. Anyway, I think it's been fun to see people push the records down, especially for uh, like the events that I haven't really tried at. I mean, it's kind of hard to call it events, but like I said, there are different sizes of boards, so each different size is a different event, 
And I particularly haven't really tried the bigger sizes of this board because they kind of bore me. But you can see that if you go to options, or actually no, not options, if you just create a new game, there are these arrows that let you change the size of the board. So if you don't want 5x5 because five five it's too big, you can go down to 4x4. Four four, and there you go. See, it's a 4x4. Four four. You can even go all the way down to a 2x2, two two, which is kind of stupid. And this board is so small that there's actually only 4 factorial equals 24 states of this puzzle. One of those is the solved state. So there's only 23 possible scrambles this game could give you. Four of those are only one move away from being solved, which means that at any given time, like that one, you have a 4 in 23 chance of having a one move scramble. And if you have a one move scramble, the timer stops the instant it starts, so the time is literally zero seconds. So this event is dumb, but like, for whatever reason, on the leaderboard, everyone went after getting the world record. So there's a nine-way tie for first place, including me, got a flex, so I'm there too, but it's a nine-way tie and it's pretty dumb. But enough of these stupid small puzzles, let's go to the bigger side. So I set an upper limit of 20 by 20 because I didn't want to crash anybody's computer, but to start, here's 10 by 10. And because we don't have 100 letters in the alphabet, I decided to go back towards a simple numbering system from 1 to 100, which means that there's a lot more text on the screen because not everything is one character. But hey, what can you do? And it's pretty nice to look at in my opinion. It looks like a giant mosaic. And whenever it becomes solved, it looks really nice because it's a smooth gradient. So it's actually kind of fun. And people have solved this. I think the person who's the, the fastest at the big ones now is either Walker Welch or Brian Johnson. And not me, because, yeah, I don't know how to do these fast. Like, when you want to strategize how you want to do this quickly, you have to make decisions like, do I want to solve um, square-shaped pieces of the puzzle because squares have the least surface area? Or, oh, that was completely wrong. Uh, squares have the least surface area per area? Or perimeter, sorry. They have the least perimeter per area. Or do I want to do long strips like this? And I'm sure someone can do an analysis of which one is more efficient, but uh, I don't really know. So that's why I feel like my strategies are kind of trash. One thing you might be wondering is why did I choose this color scheme? Like, it's kind of strange because there's lots of grays in the middle, which you might not think is pretty. And actually, my color scheme used to only involve... Well, okay, I'm sure a lot of you know about the RGB cube. And we have to figure out some way to kind of slice the RGB cube into a square that can then be projected onto this puzzle. And I think, ah, oh my god, ow, that really hurt. Okay, pretty much recovered. Anyway, like I was saying, we want to slice the RGB cube uh, in the most reasonable way as possible. And you can see this old version of loop over here, where I decided to take the slice of the RGB cube where blue was always at the maximum. So that only gave me four colors for the corners, which are pure blue, white, cyan, and magenta. And I think it actually gives this kind of vaporwave aesthetic, which I really like. But it didn't have the maximum kind of color distance possible. So in this one, I went for a diagonal where the horizontal axis measures blueness minus redness. So as you go from the left side to the right side, redness will decrease as blue increases. And then the vertical axis is just a simple green spectrum from 0 to 100. So with that, you actually get every single possible hue, but you don't get every single combination of hue plus saturation plus lightness, of course, because you need three dimensions for that. But the fact that you could say, hey, where are the greens? And the greens are somewhere. Hey, where are the oranges? And the oranges are somewhere. I like that. Oh, great. I'm looking for 69 and it's really hard. Oh, that's like a euphemism. Let's not keep that in the video. I was thinking about turning this into an app for both iOS and Android. I know that you're, you go loud players, you're still mad that I haven't made it for Android, whatever. I was planning on doing that before releasing this video, but then I just thought like, oh, my, my video upload schedule is so slow. Maybe I should just upload this and then like work on the app later. And maybe I'll like find some other developers to help me do it because this is actually a pretty simple game. I would feel really good once every single person who has a mobile phone can play this game on an even playing field. I think the records would start getting really fast then. So now we're at last row, last column. And again, I have to do the same thing where I solve a one by n minus two chunk of the column. So that would be 10 through 80. So here's 10, bring it up, bring in 20, bring it up, bring in 30, bring it up. So it's actually like maybe even easier to explain how this works um, on a big, puzzle because you can kind of see every single edge case. Uh, so it's actually, yeah, it's very fast to do that. So there's 
8 of 10. And now I use this keyhole here, which has 96 right now, to kind of move up and down and up and down to push pieces into the correct spot. So instead of just like pushing it down blindly, I see, oh, 92 and 93 are solved relative to each other. So I, I want to save those guys. So I'm going to pretend that these are already solved. So if I pretend these are already solved, then we got 94, 95, 96 would go here. 95 would go to the left of it. So that already gets me 4 out of 10, which is quite nice. Now 100 would go here, because that's 4 to the... Oh, I got that wrong. It would go here, because it's 4 to the right of 96. 91 would go to the right of that, because it loops over. 97, ne next to 96, this is pretty straightforward. And then we get solved. No, it's not solved. Okay. Oh, this is an interesting segue to something else I wanted to mention. 99 and 98 are swapped, and nothing else is swapped, which means, which means you get parity. Okay, future carry here, and while recording, I spent 10 minutes trying to explain odd parity permutation, and then I spent another hour going through all the other variations of this game. And I think this video's gotten too long, so I'll just wrap it up, but if there's enough demand, I might make a part two going over all those other variations. So that's it. If you want an outro, don't listen to me, just read the screen. But I do want to say one last thing, and that's thank you to all my speedcubing friends who really got hyped for this game when I released it. The fact that you tried to get faster while I was developing the game really motivated me to add all those extra features, and now I'm happy how it turned out. Okay, bye.